if this is going to work or not, but that's what we're going to do anyways. So, um, yeah, we had some significant things happen. Uh, Hugh Hefner died. Okay. Guys. Tom Petty died. And then we had that little incident in Las Vegas. Worst mass shooting in American history. So I thought we'd start with Hugh Hefner. You know, growing up, every young boy admired Hugh Hefner. All those girls at his disposal. And then you grow up and you realize that's the problem. Girls aren't supposed to be disposable. And, and, and Hefner, if you don't know, he founded the Playboy Empire. And he was the first person to make pornography available to the masses. So this is a big deal, okay? A very big deal. He became the face of the sexual revolution, objectifying women as bunnies and popularizing unhindered sex, okay? He's the guy. Uh, my best friend married a Playboy bunny. So he thought it was pretty cool. Then she became a radical Christian, and it destroyed the whole thing he was trying to go for, you know? Hugh's son called him a cultural pioneer. He was lauded by celebrities as a revolutionary, an American icon, a great man. I know the last time I preached to you, we talked about leaving a legacy. We talked about what kind of legacy, what kind of influence, how our lives might touch somebody else's life. Okay? Hefner's legacy was pornography. Okay? A legacy that's damaged millions of lives and families. I mean, all young boys, they had uh, Playboy magazines stashed under their, you know, Mattresses. At least that's what I was told, okay? <laughs> and the fathers, you know, they would have their magazines. And, 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 and I think that people don't understand that the negative influence that would happen. You know, these, these boys would, would form this idea of, of, of you know, a, a woman was a thing rather than a person. And, and fathers would bring this into the family, and, and somehow... A spirit was released over their marriage, a negative spirit, okay? And it would go to work destroying. Research shows that pornography intensifies the degradation of women. It deforms the sexual development of young men. They have unrealistic expectations of, of women and sexual activity. Uh, I was shocked to learn that right now, one third of, of, of pornography is, is women using it. I okay. thought it was just a guy thing, but actually, you know, women are, are, have, have probably been negatively programmed just as guys have. And, and, and really, it's a highly addictive thing. It's a doorway to, to brokenness. Uh, it leads to prostitution, human trafficking, victimization of children. It all starts with that ability to look incorrectly at another person. And I think it destroys the marriage. It's the unrealistic expectations, the desensitizing people from the real thing so that they, they pursue a fantasy. I can't tell you how many times in the counseling session a, a, a woman will say, my husband doesn't want to have intimacy with me, and I happen to know that he has a pornography problem. So he's pursuing sexuality when it's available to him, but he doesn't take the real thing. He substitute it for artificial experience. You know, I found it fascinating that Hefner was praised as a contributor to our country and our culture. And, and so I just want to point something out to you. The Bible addresses pornography under the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay. Well, how does looking at something turn into the act? Well, we all know what Jesus says. If you look at somebody with lust, you're committing the sin. Okay, and, 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 you know, 
we're supposed to have our eyes on okay and 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 we're only supposed to look at our spouse okay and fornication well i'm not married it doesn't apply to me sex outside of marriage is fornication and that's also addressed in the bible I'm not supposed to do it and here's the deal pornography incites lust that drives you to use someone for your gratification this is important that you understand why it's a problem because i now see that person as an object for my gratification what does christianity call us to do to see somebody as a person to care for to serve to introduce to jesus not an object for my use but somebody to care for in the name of Jesus Christ. In Western society, we've rejected the concept of absolute truth. When we come along in the, in the Bible and, and start saying, hey, you know, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm not supposed to have free sex, uh, the, the culture today gets a little upset about it. You know, we think that truth is personal and subjective. We think that what's true for you isn't necessarily true for me, we as in the Western culture, okay, not, not we as Christians. You know, no one has the right to force their beliefs on anybody else. You think s sex should be restricted to one relationship? Uh, well, we don't think so. Okay, and this is the way college kids think today. And even when I was in college, all right? But I remember I was trying to get away from all the sin in Los Angeles, so I went to the University of Colorado. <laughs> Whew. I'm just telling you, they have sin there too. And today's mantra, it's tolerance. You should be free to do whatever you want to do so long as you don't hurt anybody else. And this is the playboy creed, okay? Uh, uh, it's, it's contradictory, though. Here's the problem. Everything you do affects somebody else. Okay? Whatever hurts you is going to spill out onto somebody else. Hurt people hurt people. So, No. It's not just an isolated situation. It, it, it carries over into your relationships and into your mindset. It starts to change the way you communicate about sexuality and the opposite sex. Because you've now introduced an anti-biblical way of thinking that's getting infiltrated into your system. Well, Hugh Hefner, he didn't believe in the supernatural. He believed in himself, <clears throat> okay? He says, I'm a pretty moral guy. It's morality as I perceive it. Morality is what is perceived as good for the people. I try to do what's right, to do what I believe to be truly humanistic, rational, and loving, okay? So who is his God? He is. Who sets the moral compass? He does. Tries to be rational. Tries to be humanistic. Tries to be loving. He was told about an afterlife, and he said, I think an afterlife would be a really good deal. I wonder if he feels that way now. Okay. See, suddenly the afterlife has a sharp edge. Now, let me get this straight. You just set the entire world culture in the wrong direction. How does that person not just step into a difficult conversation with God? Okay. And whose morality would you prefer to be under? Hugh Hefner's version or God's? It's two very different interpretations of love. And, and you know what? As a pastor, I get to see it. I get to see it this way. You know, the young people come in and, you know, they've been taught to go for it. Okay, they have indiscriminate sex and it's just amazing. They do this tender thing and I'm not gonna tell you how to do it, but it's all bad, okay? It's just like a hookup place. No relationships, no accountability, no responsibility. Don't wanna see you again. Let's just do this and that's the way it is. And, and friends, you and I have a different value system. We have a different approach to things, especially something as important as sexuality. 
And I guess I'd like to say, it might be too late for you, Hefner, but you and I can make a difference if we decide to choose biblical morality over cultural morality. And this is not a given. We have been reprogrammed by the culture. We have had so much media influence, so much university influence, so much secular influence on us that without even realizing it, we think in terms of cultural standards rather than biblical morals. And if we if just try this, go tell somebody the biblical definition of, of a relationship, they're not going to like that conversation with you. And, and, and yet, if you stay in the conversation long enough, ask them, so how many relationships have you been in? How many sexual relationships have you been in? Do you feel used? You know, I always tell my, my confirmation class, don't let guys put their fingerprints all over your soul. Don't let them use you, practice on you for somebody else. I try to help them see that this is, this is sacred ground. Okay? And I don't think we have too much of a difficulty proving our point with the divorce rate so high to tell a woman that she's actually more valuable than being used by a guy. Now, I, I think that people are open to hearing God's perspective when we share that God cares about people and doesn't want them to be used. It's kind of interesting. I've seen interviews with porn stars and, you know, they're, they're looking back on their careers going, I'm damaged, I'm broken, I hate it, I hate my life. And uh, all that money, all that fame, no. They, they wouldn't do it over again is what they say. And, and so, you know, I caught myself the other day. I was, I can't remember what it was. It was one of the big issues. And I, and I decided to stop and pray about it. And, and, and I didn't just say, Lord, would you be with Las Vegas? I stopped and I went there. And I prayed about the people whose sons were killed in somebody else's arm, for the people who shielded other, others so that, and, and they died. I, 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 I really went there and I prayed. And I wonder if you and I were to go into our culture and pick up a topic and decide to spend some energy on it. This is what we know the Bible says about prayer. It moves the hand of God. It works. He notices. A flippant prayer, eh, he probably appreciates your heart. A prayer where you dig in on your shoes and you go for it, yeah, I think that he's going to say, all right, you want me to, you want me to protect somebody from being martyred today? I'm going to honor that prayer. You want me to, to save this soul over here? I'm going I'm to put it into motion. That's what he promises. You and I should be prayer warriors, prayer machines. We should just look through the world with eyes that think in terms of how can I release and dispense the power and grace of Jesus Christ. And I think our Playboy culture, it needs to take a second look. Do you know that today's kids don't have the same opinion about abortion that um, my generation did. Isn't that, it's a good thing, that's what I'm telling you. They're not so free to use it. They don't see it as an alternative the way our culture did. Okay? The, the, what I'm trying to say is there comes a point where people go, you know what? Um, no, I don't think that's Right? And, and, and that's going to be just biblical values getting put out there. And, and we can change things. You know, the early church, they, they took note that, that the Christians shared their bread with all but not their wives. Okay, they had a whole different value system. We used to be, hey, bread's hard to give, but you can have my wife, you know. No, it's the other way around. And, and, and here's what I want you to know. This is a sacred space. Philip Yancey says the sexual relationship between a husband and wife is the closest expression we have on earth to intimacy with God. All right? And when you're just casually in and out, when you're using people, uh, you've taken what was supposed to be sacred and you've turned it into something that you no longer are interested in because you misused it. 
Well, how do we how do we do this right? I've got three Bible verses. Job thirty one one. I, I have made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a girl <clears throat> or a guy. Okay. That's when you just decide. And you know, and as a young man, you're trying to figure out how to do this, and you'd say, Okay, she is a daughter of the king. You would just immediately redefine her. So she went from being an object to use to the daughter of the king. Whether she was aware of her identity or not, that's how you saw and defined that person. Psalm 101 says, I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not fasten its grip on me. And that's what pornography does. It fastens a grip on you. And so to avoid that grip, you have to reject that philosophy. And before you reject that philosophy, you don't even go there. My eye will not go in the wrong place. It's a process of retraining your thinking, okay? Again, see the opposite as a person made in the image of God, someone who's a child of God, God's property. Look at their soul. Well, enough of Hugh Hefner, yeah? Let's move on to some rock and roll. Tom Petty died. You know, when I was in high school, I had an MGB convertible, spoke rims, British racing green. And uh, just thought you needed to know all of this. <laughs> and I had three cassette tapes, and one of them was Tom Petty's first album. Okay, so I heard that thing a billion times. And I wasn't really a big fan, but I only had three cassettes, and that was one of them. <laughs> and, and so, you know, when he died, I took notice. You know, I followed his career. But, but as I was following his death, I noticed in an interview, he said, no one has mismanaged Jesus Christ more than Christians. And I thought, oh, boy. He went on to say religion was the base of all wars. So, for me, those are fighting words, okay? First of all, there's a big difference between religion and having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Religion is rituals. Religion is performance-based holiness, okay? Christianity is a personal friendship with the living God and Jesus Christ. So the moment that you castigate Christianity... As religion, you kind of let me know that you don't know what Christianity is all about. All right? And, and the first thing that makes me upset is he's got an opinion about Christians that isn't accurate, which means he has an opinion about Jesus Christ, which isn't accurate. And, and, and he says it's, you know, the, star, the cause of all wars. Well, you know, I've been part of the Christian church my entire life. I mean my entire life. I've been a Christian, and I've been in the church and associated with the local church and the global church all of my life. I've taken in all kinds of content from all kinds of denominations from every angle. I've read more books. I've forgotten more about Christianity than you're ever going to know, okay? That's the basketball coach's uh, joke. <laughs> Hopefully you're going to surpass your knowledge of mine. But my point is, saturated with the church. And never once did I hear a call to go to war, to hate somebody, and to kill other people. So, you know, that's, that's five decades of, of being always in conversation with church and never... Any of that. Now, there are the extremist groups. Like when we had the Pulse mass shooting here in Orlando. You know, the press. There's one church that they quoted. The Westboro Baptist Church. You know, 100 members, full of hate, and they're the only ones who get press. All the other churches, they weren't quoted. 
They didn't want their opinions because they had an angle that they wanted to work. Because the truth of the matter is, people get all upset about Christians, and I hate Christians, and I've been with people who said, I hate Christians, and we've been in a cool conversation, you know, well, you know, I'm one. What? Why do you hate Christians? And they come up with stupid things like, Christianity is the cause of all wars. Well, let's just think about this. In the last century, the atheist regimes of Stalin, Hitler, and Mao were responsible for killing 130 million people. That's the atheists. All right? Yes, it's true that some Christians, let me rephrase this, some people have misused Christianity for political gain to acquire other people's wealth. They've mismanaged the word of God in order to subjugate somebody. To control them, one of the something that guys do in their marriages. <clears throat> uh, it says in the Bible, submit. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, are you kidding me? You put up with that from him? Because if we were to sit down and do a Bible study right now, you would realize that he's got the heavy agenda. And, and, and you're, he's supposed to submit to you also. Submit to one another, it says. But we like to pick something out and use it against other people so that we get our way. All right? Well, just know this. There's a big difference between real Christianity and the stuff that the secular humanist is putting out on the airwaves right now. Very important that you understand this. And I think right now there, there, there is a time. Jesus said, you know, to love everybody. But, but, friends, he does say there is a time for battle. In fact, once he says, there's a time to get up the sword. And, and so Peter gets a sword, goes in the Garden of Gethsemane, uses a sword. And Jesus says, what are you doing? Put the sword down. Yeah, yeah, but I thought you said get a sword. Obviously, that's not what he meant. What did he mean? There comes a moment when a spiritual battle is underway. And you and I have to decide, are we going to be part of the spiritual battle or are we going to be like all these casual Christians just standing on the sidelines, just watching this world go to hell and not doing anything about it? We're supposed to pull out our spiritual sword. And what is it? It's the word of God. Amen. It's the love of God. That's what does the work. When people see the love of God in action, they take notice, okay? It changes hearts. When the Holy Spirit gets released through your prayers, wow, it can subjugate nations. So I want you to hear me. Yes, we're supposed to go to battle. You know, in the whole abortion thing, and I'm not a, I'm, abortion, I think, I think we've lost one third of a, a couple of generations because of abortion. I mean, that's a lot of killing. The Bible says, choose life. And this, it gets a little bit awkward because women say, well, who, who are you to tell me what to do with my body? And I say, well, I, I'm, <clears throat> I think that he has the ability to tell you what to do with your body. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just telling you his opinion. That if you let him come into that really difficult, broken situation... He can do something miraculous through it. Okay? Not to mention that ladies who get abortions, they always regret it. Sometimes they have big, difficult issues. And, you know, in our, this congregation, I mean, I mean, abortion was used as birth control where, where I grew up, you know? So I'm sure that, you know, we went through that awkward generation, but maybe, you know, some people get all upset and they take that battle on and Christians can say, look at that extremist. Or they can say, wow, somebody's picking up the battle. Am I battling anything? Am I battling human trafficking? Am I battling against drug addiction? Am I battling any of the social ills going on? You know, Wilberforce in England, <clears throat> he stopped slavery in the, in the, in the nation that, that had the sun never set on. Britain, England. But what you don't realize is he put a stop to all the, the alcohol abuse. There, I mean, there's just a host of social sins that dominated London and the world, and he legislated them out. One man with God changed society. 
because he cared enough, because he took on the calling to fight the cosmic battle. Are you fighting the cosmic battle? Are you putting anything in the offering plate? Are you praying about it? Are you getting connected to ministries? Are you, you know, today somebody had this cool ministry, they came to me, so I called another person and left them a message, hey, get a hold of me because I got to connect you to, because hopefully your network can turn into a new ministry of power to stop an abuse going on in the world. One call, that's all it was. I had to go through the trouble of finding their phone number. And they had to call me back, you know? And I had to leave a message. And I kept the phone out because I want to call them again. Because maybe that could be the avenue God uses. Well, I just want to remind you, in the ancient world, it was the launch of Christianity that civilized the world. I've read books about this. You know, people like to say this, we can be moral without God. But here's what you don't know. <clears throat> that morality that you, that you grab a hold of, the reason it exists is because Christians established it. And they laid the moral foundation that's been centuries of a way of thinking. And so now we don't think in terms of exploiting people. We don't think in terms of being selfish. We think in terms of how to care for other people because Christians got the hospital started and put a stop to, to the sex trade. And, and you can just go on and on and on and on, the incredible things that they stopped. Because somebody took a stance. One guy went into the gladiator, gladi gladiator theater and, and was killed. And everybody said, you know, that, that guy shouldn't have been killed. That one death, there were no more gladiator games. Okay? One guy gave his life, and, and killing people for sport was done. And, and friends, I don't know what you're about, but this is what you're supposed to be about, Jesus' ministry. And Jesus told us in Luke 4, where his ministry was preaching good news to the poor, proclaiming release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, Freeing those who are oppressed, proclaiming the favorable year of the Lord. Amen. You know, my daughter just had to do a sermon on <clears throat> the poor. And I'll never forget this one person who used to go up to poor people and say, God sees you. And, and you would just see people realize, wow, I'm not just this forgotten, nameless nobody. That's right. They, they were just in that one statement, empower them. And again, you know, proclaim release of the captives, recovery of sight to the blind. We live in a world blind to the truth about Jesus Christ. Can you defend your faith? Can you explain your faith? Can you, can, can you argue the worldview versus the Christian view? Because what's sad is most Christians have never shared their faith. I think it's like in the 97 percentile. That's broken. John Wesley says, you can't go to heaven alone. You got to bring somebody. So you better share your faith with somebody. Okay? Well, you know this church. We're engaged and involved in every aspect of Jesus' ministry that we can be. Um, again, you know, are you praying for God opportunities? I think that every one of us should go home, get out a pen, Pull out a piece of paper and write, look for God opportunity today. And put it by your cell phone when it rings and pick it up. And I bet you that next week we would have stories. Because for once you would be intentionally looking. And then the Holy Spirit would say, oh yeah, let me open up a couple of avenues. And some of them, he'll say, hey, do you remember that situation? You missed it. And you go, wow, I didn't even see it. And then another one will open up, and you won't miss it, but you won't do anything. You won't say anything. It's not in your habit yet. But now you've seen it, you're aware of it, and then it'll happen. You'll have the courage to have a conversation. 
to ask a question, to say, is there something I can pray for you about? Could I be wrong, but you, you look like you're really upset about something, and I belong to the Lord, and I want him to bring, bring his goodness to you. Yeah. Next thing you know, and, and probably not even going to be a stranger that we're scared of having an encounter with. It'll probably be somebody you know. Well, when I was reading the Bible, and I came across this cool story. You remember the woman who had a 12-year blood flow problem? And, you know, 12 years, she tried to get help, couldn't get help. She's getting worse. And she's in a crowd. She's not supposed to be in a crowd. She's in a crowd. Jesus is going by. And she says to herself, if I can just touch the fringe of his garment, I will get well. She touches it. She's healed. Okay? He says, you touched me. This is what Jesus did. He says, <clears throat> immediately, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth. I want, I want you to feel this with me. So Jesus is cruising along. Somebody touches him. He stops and perceiving in himself that the power that proceeds forth from him had gone for it. Here's what I want you to hear. There is power in the name of Jesus. Amen. There is power when you have an encounter with the Lord. There is power when you, when you pray in his name. Now, remember I said dig your shoes in and pray? Not just the, hey, Lord. You know, somebody sent me a, a, a cartoon. It was in response to Las Vegas, the prayer switchboard. And one of them said, thoughts and prayers. And the other button said, do something. I thought, wow. We like to hit the thoughts and prayers. That's pretty easy. Well, what can I do? I know. Why don't we stop and pray? Why don't you dig your shoes in and say, you know what? In the name of Jesus, something can happen. So I'm going to think about and pray with faith like the woman who touched his garment. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe Jesus can do something? Yes. Then you ought to pray that way. Amen. It's just that simple. We're here on a Thursday night when you could be watching the Buccaneers uh, Patriots game. But you decided to be here instead because you believe in Jesus Christ. And so if you're going to go ahead and believe, then why don't we go ahead and pray that way and use that name and try to set up encounters and not be so timid anymore. What, you know, how many more years do we have to be alive? You, your time of being timid is over with. If somebody says to you, I can't, I can't believe you're a Christian, say, I can't believe you're not. What foolish doctrine did you fall under? Why don't you just take the offensive? And not be offensive, but just point it out for what it is. Tell me where you came across the idea that Christianity was bad. What if somebody would have had that conversation with Tom Petty? Hmm? Then he would have had to break down, give his life to the Lord. The presence of God on earth, this is who Jesus is, the ongoing Lord and Savior of the world. Listen to this passage. There is no other name on earth by which we are saved. Acts 4.12, okay? All right? This is, you know, right now the world likes to point out a little bit of misinformation, you know, magnify a few controversies in church history, take some passage out, out of context. Jesus is the source. Jesus is your Lord. Jesus is your Savior. We need to be Jesus-focused. And that's how our souls get fixed. And this leads us to Las Vegas. You know, <clears throat> I remember the brother said, you know, he wasn't connected to any organization or, or, or religion or anything like that. As if, you know, there's nothing to blame it on. And I'm thinking, that's exactly what we need to blame it on. He wasn't connected 
to any soul cultivating, God encountering organization. He grew up with a bad father because he was a bank robber, okay? But your father was bad. Um, Notice this. Remember we talked about the destruction of the family in uh, Playboy? Look at how he has the destruction of the family going on in his world. And what's going to happen when fathers aren't there? Okay? And somebody's connecting them to God and guiding their life and laying down a moral foundation. I get so frustrated with Christian parents who say, well, I'm going to let my kids decide what religion they, they, they want for themselves. I say, really? So you're telling me that, that Jesus Christ is that insignificant to you? That your Christianity is, is, is not worth passing on to somebody else? That's embarrassing. You know, they usually quit the church when I tell them that. But you have to tell them that. Somebody's got to wake them up. You know, this shooter, he's, he's got no positive influences in his life. His Starbucks barista said he used to demean and berate his girlfriend with controlling behavior. All right? Once again, we get to see an insight into the soul of somebody. Of course, I'm going to ask, do you berate and insult people when the barista's slow? I've been known to be an impatient person. You know, it shouldn't take me 12 minutes to get my Starbucks. I start to get an attitude. You know, and that's the moment when we're supposed to say, okay, are you a Christian? Because this is 12 minutes of prayer opportunity. This is a prayer, 12 minutes of opportunity to encounter somebody else and lift their spirits up, to say, a God bless you over them, to leave just a little hint of a kindness. This is the way you got to think. Because what if somebody would have encountered him, had the courage to say something to him, and God got involved, and suddenly he wouldn't have decided to carry all those weapons and kill a bunch of people? wonder how many mass murders don't happen because God sent his angel, us, to do some work. When there's no spiritual influence, you're going to become a horrible person. All right? It's, that's what the self is all about, unbridled selfishness. Well, friends, only Jesus is going to be able to make a change in, in, in the sinful world. It's not going to be getting smarter. I remember the, one of the guys from the, the Holocaust, the German Holocaust, I said, you know, I used to think it was all about education until I realized the Germans were the smartest people on earth. And what do they do with their intelligence? Figured out how to kill more people than anybody else. Okay? It's not about being smart enough to, to, to overcome sin. It's not about behavior modification. It's about an encounter with your creator. And, and, and friends, we're supposed to be doing God's work. You know, how were you, were you not moved by the heroic actions of people while the shooting is going on, saving other people, giving their lives so that somebody could be saved and lived a little bit longer? That's the way we're supposed to live. But here's what's really cool about Christians. We don't just get to help you live another decade or two or three we get to help you understand how to live eternal life. We get to connect you back to the source of life, a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We get to empower you with the Holy Spirit, the presence of God with you, on you, within you at all times. Okay, there, there's what we're doing, it's beyond heroic, it, it's, it's of eternal significance. And that's why the church of Jesus Christ is needed. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's our calling. So, I don't know how many weeks it'll take before Vegas is just another one of those events. I'd, I'd kind of like to use it as a, a, a pin on the desk where I go, all right, from now on, I'm going to fight sin. And I've given you your assignment.
the right next to your cell phone, look for the God opportunity today. All right? If you do it, you're going to come back and you say, Pastor, you're not going to believe it. I had a God opportunity. All right? Lord, Vegas, it's a symptom. It wasn't some Islamic terrorist. It was just somebody, a troubled soul. And there's a lot of troubled souls out there. Would you give us the eyes to see them and the courage to step over the, the uncomfortable zone and to release your words, to release your love, to care enough to listen, to get involved in people's lives? Would you give us the courage to talk to people that we know who are, are confused about Christianity and are, are spouting off the wrong information? Would you cause us to learn how to talk to somebody? rather than just dismiss, I, I'll never be able to talk to somebody. Lord, would you help us reorient the compass of this world morally so people wouldn't be just destroying themselves and missing out on all the precious gifts that you have. Speaking of precious gifts, this leads us to the communion table. Man, we were separated from God. We had no hope. And then God sent Jesus to us to save us. And the moment you accept Jesus into your life, you are saved. No one can snatch you from his hands. And so I want you to know that this is the relationship God has established with you. And this isn't a philosophy we follow. This isn't a, a, a rule book that we try to get good at. This is all about an encounter with the living Lord. It's personal. Make it personal. Because he personally gave his life for you. On the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took the bread and first he blessed it and then he broke it saying, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner also he took the cup. And as he poured it, he said, This cup is the covenant of my blood shed for the remission of your sins. Drink ye of it and be thankful. Judy, would you come forward? Aggie, are you able to come forward? Jim Ante, is that you out there? Could you help me out? we have the guys in the girls' side, okay? Come forward and feast on the love of God.
Fantastic week. Remember, God opportunity today.